Thanks for tuning in. Ham Talk Live will be on the air shortly. Please stand by. Thanks for tuning in. Ham Talk Live will be on the air shortly. Please stand by. This episode of Ham Talk Live is brought to you by Tower Electronics. For cables, connectors, and more, call 920-435-2973 or visit pl-259.com. And buy the ham station. Get your new radio or antenna by calling 800-729-4373 or go to hamstation.com. It's ham radio. Good evening, everybody. It's time for another episode of Ham Talk Live. It's episode number 49. Ham Radio from Space with Richard Garriott to Caillou, W5KWQ, recorded live on Thursday, January 26, 2017. I'm your host, Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Ham Talk Live. Tonight we'll be joined by Richard Gary at W5KWQ. He'll be taking your questions about ham radio from space and his new book entitled Explore and Create. We'll take your calls live in just a few minutes. Last week, Carl Lutzel Schwab, K9LA, was here to talk about sunspots. And if you missed the show, you can listen anytime at hamtalklive.com or on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, SoundCloud, or YouTube. So think of some questions, and after the interview, you can call us. You can call us on Skype at the username HamTalkLive, or you can call us by telephone. That number is 812-NET-HAM-1. That's 812-638-4261. You can also go ahead and tweet us a question now via Twitter. Our uh, handle is at ham talk live so i'll be back with richard right after this word from tower electronics right here on ham talk live this episode of ham talk live is brought to you in part by tower electronics tower electronics has been the ham's dime store since 1978 when you need connectors mobile and handheld antennas cables or adapters visit scott or jill at a ham fest near you or you can order online at pl-259.com or call 920-435-2973 stock up on those supplies like pl-259 and in connectors sma adapters audio cables soldering supplies mobile antennas and ham Sticks. Their silver plated in connectors are even used on the International Space Station. Tower Electronics carries MFJ, Comet, Daiwa, OPEC, Workman, and Ham Pro products. And don't miss their 0% off sale going on now. Tower Electronics online at pl 259.com. Proud to sponsor this episode of Ham Talk Live. Sorry for the delay. Your host, Neil Rapp, is reading a book on anti gravity. And he just can't put it down. Now, here's more Ham Talk Live. Thanks to Scott and Jill at Tower Electronics for sponsoring the show tonight. To help bring you Ham Talk Live, Jill will be at the Collinsville, Illinois Ham Fest on Saturday. Scott will be in Arcadia, Florida. And next week, they'll be at the Miami Hamboree in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And then the Orlando Hamcation. Or you can call them at 920-435-2973. Or visit their website at pl-259.com and tell them you heard it right here 
on Ham Talk Live. We're on the air every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time at HamTalkLive.com. And if you missed the show, you can listen to the archive on the website or you can download it from most popular podcasting sites. Richard Gary at W5KWQ is a founding father of the video game industry and commercial space flight industry, a flown astronaut and an accomplished explorer. He's been inducted into the Computer Gaming Hall of Fame and has received the Industry Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, he is credited with creating the now ubiquitous term Avatar. And among the gaming community, he is known as Lord British. He authored the acclaimed Ultima series and has built three leading game companies, Origin Systems, which was sold to Electronic Arts, Destination Games, which was sold to NCSoft, and Portalarium, where he is building Shroud of the Avatar, a successor to his previous works. As a principal shaper of the uh, commercial spaceflight industry, he co-founded Space Adventures, the only company to arrange space flights for private citizens, and is the sixth private astronaut to live aboard the International Space Station. The son of a NASA astronaut, Owen W5LFL, Richard became the first second-generation astronaut and has been a uh, key leader in civilian and commercial space as an investor and board member of institutions such as the XPRIZE Foundation, Space Adventures, and Planetary Resources. Richard is an avid explorer, having traveled around the globe from the jungles of the Amazon to the South Pole, the deep seas of the Titanic, and hydrothermal vents to orbiting the Earth above the Earth at the International Space Station. His nonprofit and philanthropic efforts um, include serving on the boards of the Explorers Club and the Challenger Center for Science Education. Richard lives with his uh, wife, Leticia, um, also an entrepreneur, and their two children, Kinga Salong and Ronan Fee. I hope I, I got that right. Uh, his new book, uh, Explore, Create, chronicles his life from the early days of video gaming through his space flight and to the present day. So, Richard, thank you so much for coming on Ham Talk Live tonight. Absolutely. My pleasure. Great to be with you. And, uh, boy, uh, uh, you know, it's not often I hear somebody read the whole bio. That's a uh, uh, I've had a lot of fun in my life, as you can tell. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> you, you've you've had a, a great uh, batch of experiences. And uh, tonight we want to focus on um, your trip to the International Space Station. And I know you could talk about this for weeks on end. Mm-hmm. Uh and we don't have that long. We have 45 minutes, and they cut me off. So uh, no <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the trip and maybe focus more on, you know, how ham radio played a role in that. Sure, sure, of course. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned my father, uh, W5LFL. Um, you know, when I, when I was uh, young, let me let me back up from the space flight and, and, and kind of introduce uh, my uh, journey through ham uh, as well. You know, my, my father, before he became an astronaut, uh, he and my grandfather, whose call sign I now have, uh, W5KWQ, the two of them went and got uh, certified together when uh, my dad was uh, you know, high school, college age, uh, and when uh, my parents moved to Houston, Texas, uh, where my father was an astronaut, and my grandfather still lived back in Enid, Oklahoma, uh, the ham rig was set up in my father's office, and uh uh, you know, every other night or so, that was sort of the way we sat down and uh, had long talks with Grandpa was with our our ham rig, and so uh, you know, so I grew up with uh, you know ham as a, a common uh, tool of the household, and so by the time I uh, by the time I flew, uh, my father had already taken uh, his uh, the, well, in fact, the first uh, ham radio setup uh, uh, to space. Uh, aboard STS-9, the ninth launch of the space shuttle. And uh, that was the first time an astronaut in space spoke to the general public directly. And uh, as you obviously know, uh, ham uh, uh, ham radio operators around the globe uh, could uh, could speak with my dad, uh, including, I remember, some of his favorites were people like uh, King Hussein of Jordan, uh, the previous King of Jordan. Uh, was a big ham, and uh, he's, uh, we got, had a chance to speak directly from space with him. And so, so when I 
we began to put together the plan for my own space flight, uh, I was going to be flying 25 years almost to the day uh, uh, from my father's uh, 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 shuttle flight. And so I knew that as his son and on such a good uh, milestone, uh, I would be remiss if I did not uh, also not only uh, you know take uh, ham radios or operate ham radios when I was on board, uh, but try to kind of uh, push it up a notch from the status quo. And uh, as many of you, the hams out there who, who do some contacts with uh, uh, either the ISS uh, or satellites, uh, you probably know, or some of them may know, there's, there's actually a couple of radios that have been on board the International Space Station for, for many, many years. And that's not uncommon for astronauts and cosmonauts to use those radios. And so the addition that I did is I took up slow scan television. And so I took up a handheld uh, microphone addition that has a slow scan TV uh, device in it. And uh, that way, when, when I was doing other experiments, and so I couldn't be at the radio myself, uh, I would uh, hook up this slow scan television uh, device and I could leave it at a window, sort of automatically taking a picture every couple of minutes and transmitting it down and taking the picture again and transmitting it down. And so therefore, the, the uh, radio would be uh, in use uh, as close to 24-7 as I could, uh, and, uh, uh, and people could get, uh, you know, even if there wasn't somebody live to talk to, they could get an echo, uh, kind of a selfie portrait of themselves from the International Space Station while I was, while I was up there. And, uh, uh, but I have to tell you, one of, the, one of the other things I did that I had uh, good fun with was... Uh, uh, because I was doing this, this slow scan TV activities and I had a laptop in the loop as well, it, it also meant that the, the day I arrived on the station as I was just getting uh, all the gear uh, set up, I brought a uh, folder full of, uh, of images, of pre-selected images that I could transmit down for the first uh, few orbits around the Earth uh, that, uh, that I personally had fun with uh, where uh, I sent down uh, images of either test patterns from like the old-fashioned television test patterns or uh, a variety of eye tests uh, and then some kind of comical uh, pieces like, uh, you know, uh, pictures of a, a, a side of ham, you know, ham <laughs> space. and uh, or, or, or pictures of my dad, uh, you know, uh, speaking from his, his ham radio aboard the shuttle. So in any case, I had, a, I had a great time setting it up. I had a great time doing it. And uh, but some of the some of the most interesting things that uh, uh, that I remember from uh, operating in ham was not only just the great conversations I had with people truly all over the globe, but uh, also how uh, how 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 impressed I was with the community when I would do things like it might be for the crew it might have been you know two or three o'clock in the morning let's call it uh, I might have woken up in the middle of the night to you know go to the head or something uh, I would drift back by past the ham radio that is sitting by a window. I look out the window and I might be looking down at, say, Australia. And it was, in this the case I'm describing, it was dark over Australia. It was the, Everyone in the ground would have known that the crew was asleep. Uh, this was a sleep schedule. And so there would be no real reason to expect anyone on board the International Space Station to be communicating down. But all I had to do was click the, uh, the transmit button on the microphone and immediately I'd be swamped with three or four attempts at contact. <laughs> and so it was, uh, uh, it was really quite amazing to just think about the fact that, you know, when you're up there as an astronaut uh, and that there's still people all over the world who just have their gear turned on, tuned in, and nearby to where if you just cycle the microphone, uh, they will uh, assume that that's a live body up there attempting to transmit, which it, in this case it absolutely was, and, you know, had great 2 a.m. conversations as I uh, traveled across, uh, in this case, uh, uh, Australia at, you know, 17,000 miles an hour. Yeah, and we're going to listen, actually, to a, a couple of those in, in just a little bit, too. So uh, we'll give you a little idea of uh, what that sounded like, uh, both up there and down here. Uh, now, you mentioned your father, Owen, W5LFL, and uh, uh, his... Um, being the first person, you know, uh, to to speak to the general public from space, uh, from Space Shuttle Columbia back in '83, um, tell us how that impacted your your desire to to go up there, and um, 
how that uh, inspired some parts of, of your new book, and that's uh, called Explore Create. So tell us a little bit about the book and the inspiration. Well, you know, what was interesting about growing up in an astronaut household at that time, and I'm sure that it's largely true still today, uh, but, uh, you know, when, when, when my dad would come home from the office, which, uh, you know, of course, was NASA, he would often come home with an armload of high-tech gear, and, uh, you know, the ham radio sort of fit into this pantheon, but it would include, in addition to the ham radio gear, uh, it might be things like uh, something that at the time was referred to as a photo multiplier tube, basically, a, in this case, a hand-forged uh, piece of aluminum that you could screw a camera lens into the front of and a telescope's eyepiece into the rear of and uh, turn a little, rotate a knob on on the side, and this photo multiplier tube would take a very dark image and brighten it. And uh, today we know that technology as night vision, but the night vision didn't exist at this time. So, you know, my dad was bringing back this thing that was really going to be used for starlight magnification, but we would use it to go run around in the backyard and chase the cat who had no idea how we could see in the dark. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and similarly, he would bring home, you know, optical prism glasses that would reverse right and left because they had learned that if you wear these things for three days, that your left and right vision will correct itself. I mean, well, We'll, we'll re- your brain will reverse the image, uh, but then when you take them off, it takes you about three days to you know, to to reorient your left right vision the other direct, other way around. And and these were the just kind of tool. These were just kind of the toys that we would play with. So the whether it was a ham radio or optics or uh, you know other forms of electronics, uh, uh, you know these were these were the the things we we did at home. And and even for example, my. Uh, my senior, my junior and senior year science fair project was actually related to ham radio operations. Uh, in, in particular, uh, don't forget, this is uh, when I was in high school, this is the day before personal computers. I was there right at the advent of personal computers. And so uh, when my dad or, or other ham radio operators, many of the people here on uh, listening in today, you know, if you want to try to talk to someone over the horizon, you know, you have to find a frequency that you can bounce off the ionosphere and try to reach beyond the horizon by finding a, a frequency that will create a good focal point at the distance you want to reach. And in my dad's time, uh, they knew this, uh, you know, my, my, my dad's specialty was upper ionospheric physics. He was, uh, he was trying to bounce radio waves off the ionosphere himself and was uh, becoming sort of a specialist at it. But, it. but he was doing it with slide rule and doing it sort of a guess at a time and kind of interpolating from there. And I was already becoming a kind of computer whiz kid, and so my dad turned to me and said, hey, Richard, you could probably write a program that if I gave you a atmospheric profile, you could very, and, and you could very quickly run through a set of frequencies and show which frequencies would be best for which distances of communication. And I said, you're right, I can do that. So, uh, you know, he helped me with the math. I wrote out the code. And for two years, I earned my first place ribbons in in competitions by uh, first starting with radio wave propagation, but then moving on into sound wave propagation in air and in water and uh, and even uh, uh, geophysical stuff underground. And so, uh, but it really all goes back again to ham radio. Wow, that now that's a science fair project. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, you know, I was uh, I was a BC student, but I was uh, I aced science fairs. I I, uh, I I won many of them through uh, from kindergarten through through graduation. Well, it sounds like um, sounds like you're definitely uh, the whiz kid, uh, which, which reminds me a little bit of myself. I wasn't quite that far along, but. But I was uh, kind of early adopter into into computing as well. Um, mm-hmm. So tell us tell us about the book. Um, how how that all leads into um, your book about um, exploring and and creating things. Yeah, well, you know what's interesting is uh, you, you mentioned up top uh, in my bio, you know, this kind of interesting hybrid that I've had through my life of. Of both being a creator of video games, I've, uh, I've been very fortunate to create a number of bestsellers down through the years, and and help set standards for both visuals and user interface, and even you know, broader design ideas. And as well, at the same time, I've always been this avid explorer and been to the, you know, deep sea and space and all around all seven continents. And uh, and 
you know, when I think about those things, I then watch other people trying to create games or create original products of various kinds. And one of the things I've noticed is when I observe others and I try to sort out who can do this well and uh, and who has a harder time, with, you know, creating original, compelling uh, content uh, or, or ideas broadly, whether it's business or science or, or, or a story or entertainment, uh, I started to notice there was this theme. And the theme to me was uh, was associated with my exploration, you know. I and I then began to to realize that I sort of, uh, at least for me, found that uh, what allowed me to, or at least aided me greatly in being a successful creator of original ideas, was because I'm I'm a, not only just an avid explorer, but you know I I'm a a, a voracious consumer of knowledge around me. And so I I not only like to explore physically, but I like to explore in literature, I like to explore, you know, any new subject that comes up that I am pondering for a product or an experience. You know, I, I go buy a research library on that subject. I pay a lot of attention to the details of how that subject is implemented in the world around me. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I find that, uh, you know, when, you, when it comes to trying to be a creator, those that, you know, decide they want to create by stepping off where someone has recently been you know, saying, hey, you know, the best game I've seen around might play like this, and I like that kind of game, but I know how to improve it incrementally. Those are usually not successful. Uh, the ones that are more successful are the ones who say, I have a wholesale revision of how the industry works or how this product line works or how to tackle this kind of problem. And those inspirations usually come from very far afield from, you know, from my inspirations for computer games, for example, you know, come from uh, movies, they come from travel, they come from, uh, you know, uh, uh, moral philosophy as, much, as often as not. They come from a uh, study of linguistics uh, and the uh, sociology around those linguistics. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I find that my best creation comes from the deep research that I do uh, in, in unrelated fields. And so that's sort of, that was sort of the basis of the book, is sort of uh, trying to draw those together. And uh, it's, uh, the book is written as a, it's a collection of short stories with these little interstitials to, to collect them together or to hopefully tie them together, where I move from a creation story to an exploration story. Uh, and then the interstitials are often challenges. Uh, where I challenge somebody, I say, look, you know, if you live, uh, say, for example, here in New York City, where I'm talking to you from right now, you know, the city right now, and for the five years that I've been up here, uh, there are six-foot-tall meter in a, around uh, liquid nitrogen tanks on every six or eight uh, street corner all through Manhattan. And most New Yorkers walk by it and don't even notice, but uh, come, having come here from the outside, that was one of the first things I noticed. And uh, it pretty quickly bothered me as to why are these things here and why don't they go away? Uh, and I put some photographs of these in the book, and I challenge people to figure out what they are. And, uh, and I'll leave that for you to figure out. So uh, if you go uh, uh, Google liquid nitrogen tanks New York City you will, and go to images, you will see that all over New York there are these tanks. And the real question is, why are they there? And these are the sort of details that I, that I, I refer to when I, I say, you know, pay attention to the world around you. Uh, understand as much as you can. Uh, be bothered when you don't understand enough to go dig up the answer yourself. Uh, and I think that helps in the process of creation. All right. So that book is called Explore, Create, and you can uh, pick that up just about anywhere. Um, over Christmas break, I had a chance to go home and uh, visit with my dad, and, uh, and we dug up a uh, cassette tape um, that. Um, we recorded of your dad uh, on two meters uh, talking from space. I was 13 years old at the time uh, in junior high, and I still remember the day uh, very vividly. It was a Sunday morning. We were up uh, trying to trying to you know listen in and hoping that you know we we caught a pass. We didn't have uh, you know all the um, technology to tell you know exactly when and where that was going to happen and. Uh, getting ready for church and and all of a sudden you know we thought well we better grab the tape recorder and and um and, and all of a sudden we heard your dad calling and we missed it and it's like oh no we missed it <laughs> so we go back and grab you know the, the, the tape recorder and and hope for um 
a little bit more, and this is uh, what we heard. WD9 Happy Easter Egg. WB5WFL, WB9UKG, WB9UKG, WB9UKG. W5LFL from WB9VPG, Whiskey Bravo 9, Victor Papa Golf, WB9VPG, WB9VPG. Come on, acknowledge. We missed it on tape. You know that was that was pretty uh, pretty memorable, and even though he didn't hear us, uh, it did land me on the front page of the local newspaper. But uh, <laughs> that, you know, it was it was just fascinating to hear you know somebody from space for the first time, and um, you had a chance to operate from there, and uh, you've uh, been gracious enough to share some audio. Um, from your trip so we'll we'll play mm-hmm. this and then uh we'll kind of talk about uh where this is uh where this is heard otherwise i agree to make the contact oscar november 4 lima x-ray alpha as i'm flying by here on the iss this is richard gary at w5 kwq 73 to you thanks for the contact i heard uh, foxtrot alpha kilo delta could you please call back Yes, my call is Foxtrot 5, America, Sierra, Delta. Fox 5, Alpha, Sierra, Delta, near Paris, QSL. Foxtrot 5, Alpha, Sierra, Delta, near Paris. I got the QSL there. Uh, what's your name? Yes, my name is Jérôme, Juliet, Echo, Romeo, Oscar, Mike, Echo. Jérôme is my name, Roger. Jerome, uh, great to make the contact with you there in Paris uh, on your call sign uh, Foxtrot 5 Alpha Sierra Delta. Great QSL, I hear you 5 by 9. Thank you. Bye bye, 73. Yeah, 73, Richard. It was uh, a pleasure to meet you on VR today. 73, Richard. I'll see you later. Bye bye. So that's uh, some audio of you from the from the ISS. And, and, and tell our listeners where that audio is, is hidden. Ah, well, that uh, uh, that actually was sent to me by the individual uh, on the ground who is also one of the players of my new game, Shroud of the Avatar. So, uh, uh, you know, just to tie all these, all these communities together, uh, you know, as, as you, no one uh, listening would be surprised, uh, uh, ham radio operators come in all stripes, including uh, those that uh, play uh, medieval fantasy role-playing games, which is uh, obviously my core business. Yeah, so, so a little audio from uh, Shroud of the Avatar. So that's that exactly right. So cool. yeah, so, exactly right. So we've, uh, uh, in fact, we we've now he sent me that recording, and then we took it and we it, it, in the Shroud of the Avatar, even though it's sort of a medieval fantasy game, uh, we do have some kind of uh, Tesla style technology creeping in, a little bit of steampunk technology clicking in. Uh, and so we even put in these cylinder record players and these ethereal amplification devices, basically radios. And uh, uh, and so we put that recording actually in the game. So uh, any ham radio operators come and play Shroud of the Avatar, and you can uh, uh, hear some ham, uh, some actual ham chatter uh, from Earth to space uh, and back uh, as well. Well, how cool is that? Well, we got to pay pace bills but uh, i'll be back and uh, we're going to take some calls Uh, we'll take your calls after this message from the ham station right here on ham talk live this episode of ham talk live is brought to you by the ham station 
For over 37 years, the Ham Station has sold new and used radios, antennas, accessories, and equipment to hams everywhere. Give Dan or Jeff a call at 800-729-4373 or order online at hamstation.com. Ham Station carries all the major brands like Icom, Yezu, and Kenwood, and they have a wide selection of radio scanners, MFJ accessories, Heil Sound products, amplifiers by Mirage and Ameritron, Kushcraft antennas, and more. Easy online ordering is at hamstation.com or call 1-800-729-4373 to place an order and talk it over with the experts. The Ham Station, proud to sponsor this episode of Ham Talk Live. Ham Talk Live with Neil Rap. Join the conversation. Call us on voice with Skype at Ham Talk Live or give us a call at 812 Net Ham 1. That's 812 638 4261. Now, here's more Ham Talk Live. Welcome back to Ham Talk Live, the ham station as you covered for both new and used equipment. Call Jeff or Dan at 800 729 4373 or go to hamstation.com. Tell them you heard it on ham talk live well it's time for your calls now if you have a question for richard uh, give us a call at 812 net ham one that's 812-638-4261 or you can skype us at ham talk live or you can tweet us at ham talk live as well uh, while we're waiting on the calls richard i wanted to ask you which uh, which radio were you using um, when you were on the space station well, there were two that were up and operational, both the uh, uh, Kenwood, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, yeah, Kenwood TM700 and an Ericsson uh, NPX. Uh, I used them both, but I, the, uh, if memory serves me, serves me well, it was the Kenwood uh, that I primarily used, uh, and mostly just because I could attach uh, the uh, slow scan television device to it. Uh, and that I left on orbit, and so... Uh, I'm guessing uh, a few of you may have seen other images uh, brought down uh, since then uh, because, uh, uh, you know, I left it on board for, so for future hams to use. Yeah, great. And, yeah, the uh, the Ericsson is, is finally given up, and so uh, we're working on uh, getting um, a new Kenwood up there uh, soon, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully they'll get that all, all funded and, and launched up there soon, ready to go. We do have a call on the line, so uh, let's go to that. Who's this? My name is Chris, um, Victor Alpha 3, Echo Charlie Oscar. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Yeah, Chris, right sounds good. Hi, Richard. Uh, we worked in 2008 when you are on, uh, on the space station. A uh, really proud moment of my life. And I got to say thank you very much for doing that, working so many people. It was amazing to hear you work the pile up. And um, I was one of your last uh, people. You were packing up your gear to head uh, back to Earth uh, that day. Uh, next morning at work, I saw you on CNN in a lawn chair in Kazakhstan. And it was just, uh, it was just blew my mind. To, it sort of made the planet so much smaller to see a guy I just talked to in Kazakhstan the next day. Uh, back to you, Richard. Uh, yeah, no, thanks, Chris, very much. You know, and uh, thanks for the thought there, too, about those contacts. You know, I had uh, uh, one of my other kind of personal goals when I went up. I had a very busy schedule of uh, experiments and other activity, and, uh, you know, it set aside uh, maybe an hour a day to uh, try to work the radios. And, uh, and I, was, I, was, I was on orbit for about the same amount of time as my dad had been up on Space Lab. But I knew that he also was very busy doing things other than ham radio. Uh, and so one of my goals was to make more contacts than he did, just for you know, bragging rights as, uh, as his son. Uh, and, but I only thought of that once I was on orbit, so I actually didn't know exactly what his count was. And so I actually, I, uh, somewhere between pintupled and, and uh, tenfolded uh, his, uh, his contact list just because I was, I was just so devoted to doing it. That, com com that combined with the fact that, you know, as, as you say, working the pileup, you really, you sort of, as soon as you realize how many people are trying to reach you, you you're really disappointed if you don't manage to read back clearly someone's call sign. And, and so, you know, knowing how it 
well, frankly, it probably felt very similar to me on orbit. You really want to do this well. And so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I remained very diligent. And my biggest problem on orbit was finding more places to record all my contacts. I began to use the backside of all my instruction manuals uh, to find enough paper to write down all the contacts I was making so I could, uh, uh, you know, uh, keep track of it for um, back on the ground. Well, Richard, you're, you're working them like a pro, and I, I look forward to reading your book. And I'll, uh, I'm sure there's other people calling, so I'll let you go and uh, make some more calls. Thank you again very, very much. Thank you, Chris. Really appreciate it. Nice to talk to you again eight years later. Yep. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for calling. Appreciate it. 812-NET-TAM-1, 812-638-4261 is the telephone number, or the high-tech way is, is Skype us at Ham Talk Live. If you have a uh, question or a comment for Richard Gary at W5KWQ, give us a call now at 812-NET-TAM-1, 812-638-4261. Four two six one. Uh, now, what uh, did you did you spend most of your time uh, since you went uh, with the uh, Russians? Did you spend most of your time in that Russian module, or were you in the U.S. module? Where did you spend most of your your time when you were on board? Well, funny you should ask because uh, uh, that ended up being a, a political issue just prior to my flight. I originally was scheduled to uh, do a lot of work in the U.S. segments. Uh, then just prior to my flight due to politics, uh, the U.S. government actually tried to uh, keep me out of anything other than the Russian segment. Um, fortunately, however, the rules of space are like the rules of the open sea where the commander of the vessel makes the rules. And so uh, despite uh, governmental objection, uh, I got clearance from the crew commander to uh, continue my uh, work as originally planned. So I, I did, in fact, spend uh, uh, a significant amount of time in, in all the modules uh, doing a variety of uh, research, a variety of kinds of research. Uh, the, some of the research I was doing was on visual acuity. It turns out I'm the first person who's ever flown with uh, corrective eye surgery. Uh, and so they studied my eyes in detail and have since then uh, approved uh, corrective eye surgery for astronaut candidates, uh, and that I needed to do in a very brightly lit uh, module. Uh, I did uh, other uh, uh, things like protein crystal growth that really needed to be undisturbed, and so the central corridor of uh, modules would have been inappropriate uh, from uh, just uh, not getting bumped into and having you know, little vibration. So that instead uh, sat uh, you know, way up at the bow of the space station, which was uh, not used, uh, that area was not used much, so I could let an experiment sit there and cook for the two weeks I was in space. So I was all over. Okay, very good. 812-NET-TAM-1 is the phone number. 812-638-4261 to give uh, a call to uh, Richard, W5KWQ. We have about five minutes left, so uh, if you want to call, now's the time to do so. And, and kind of, maybe kind of a, a strange question, have, have you ever tried to contact the station from down here? You know, I have. I've actually uh, been successful. I, I actually was unsuccessful myself. You know, just like you said one time when you uh, were trying to call up to the station, uh, you know, I, I have done that myself. I've been actually at NASA uh, when we had some unsuccessful attempts to uh, reach the station. But uh, uh, then uh, on my own and uh, uh, often with school kids, we'll occasionally uh, also make, try to make ISS contact. And the, in more recent times, we've been uh, more successful. I think that uh, the process is just better known now, and you know when the station is really traveling overhead and the crew on board is uh, listening out uh, at the right time, so it's just easier to coordinate. So uh, it, more recently, I've had more success uh, in, the, in the early days I would say I had more failures. 812-NET-TAM-1. 812-638-4261 is the number to call. And and that's kind of reassuring to know that sometimes it doesn't work <laughs> for you, yeah. too. <laughs> no, exactly right. Exactly right. You know, actually, one of my biggest uh, disappointments of uh, my ham radio use is one of, the, one of the contacts I really wanted to make was with a group of friends who were going to be in Austin, Texas, were camping out on some property that I have, and they were they were actually on the property for different reasons that they were going to be camped out there anyway. Uh, but uh, one of my friends was a ham radio operator, and he brought out a rig, and 
the group all got around the campfire and watched the ISS go by, and we did not manage to connect. I was about two minutes late uh. to get the rig set up, and uh, just getting the rig set up and getting the trying to get the connection going. We just uh, a little bit too late, a little bit too off uh, target, and didn't quite make the connection. But I was. You know, that, that bothered me for days. Well, it still bothers me to this day, actually, because I still remember so vividly this because, uh, you know, you, you disappoint somebody with, uh, you know, trying to make a contact. So uh, I definitely know the agony of defeat uh, as well. Yeah. In my teaching career, I, I've found that uh, uh, experiments always work until you do them in front of kids. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it doesn't matter, you know, if it works every single time you do it in front of kids and no, it doesn't work. So exactly right. Yeah. We're all susceptible to, uh, to those moments. 812 net ham one is the number eight, one, two, six, three, eight, four, two, six, one, just a couple of minutes left. We've got time for, for one more call here. If you want to chime in at ham talk live, eight, one, two net ham one. Um, let's see, there was something else I was going to ask and it is, it has escaped me, um, for the moment. Um, your, um, your book, uh, is available how? Yeah, it just, uh, the book really just came out. So this is the end of week one for the book launch, uh, and just the start of, uh, a book tour. Um, you know, so uh, uh, Harper Collins is the publisher, and uh, you know, you can get to whatever your favorite book reseller is, uh, both uh, uh, the the the, the brick and mortar stores as well as uh, digital places like Amazon and others. Uh, all should have it. It's even available as a audio book and uh, as a digital uh, book as well. So all the all the forms you might like, whatever suits your fancy, you can track it down. And, uh, you know, it's funny that even uh, I, I, I often joke with people that, you know, even if you won't like the book, you might uh, just find the, the list of people I managed to, to put a blurb on the back of the book uh, uh, made me particularly happy. And I, I think it sounds like a pretty, pretty good group of endorsers. It includes everybody from Elon Musk to, uh, uh, to Stephen Hawking. Uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Ernest Klein who wrote a book called Ready Player One, a recent bestseller that I was sort of the inspiration for his uh, main character. To uh, it includes uh, uh, people like Alexei Lanoff, the first person to do uh, spacewalk, and and Steve Wozniak, the developer of the Apple II computer. All those folks and more, you know, stuck a blurb on the back for me, and uh, so uh, hopefully that'll convince a few people to at least uh, give it a shot. Yeah, yeah, you've got quite an uh, impressive list um, on the cover there. So uh, appreciate you uh, taking time out to talk to us and come on the show and, and talk about the book a little bit and talk about your experiences in space and and thank you for um, making all those contacts and and helping us out and and getting some some space into ham radio. We we sure appreciate it and. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. Wonderful. My pleasure. I sure appreciate it as well, and uh, look forward to uh, talking to you again, if uh, not here on Skype, uh, maybe from the, back on the ham radio frequencies, uh, either terrestrially or from space. Oh, that would be excellent. I, I would uh, thoroughly enjoy that. Well, that's a wrap for this week's edition of Ham Talk Live. I'd like to thank my guest, Richard Gary at W5KWQ, and everyone out there in cyberspace for listening and calling in. And I invite you back next Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And for a list of all of our upcoming guests, just go to hamtalklive.com. So for now, this is Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, saying 7375, and may the good DX be yours.